Just they don't sing. <laughs> okay, so first of all you asked where you're going to see the video. So the videos go online, they go on YouTube, and they go on my website and the major social networks. And then they go as audio on SoundCloud and iTunes. So if you use a smartphone <coughs> and you want to listen to it, then you can download either SoundCloud which has all the lectures in audio, and now they're starting to go up on uh, iTunes as podcasts. What if I don't have an iPhone? So you can take CDs. What? Yeah, I brought CDs okay. with lectures. Mm -hmm. And if you want to listen to them, there's, there's, if you don't have a smartphone and you want still audio, then contact my, my secretary. We'll send you MP3 files. Or the computer. Just go to YouTube. Uh, you can go to YouTube and uh, download the MP3 file. But some people like to listen. They don't want to see the junk that's on the suggested. That's what I was talking about last time. That you know, the the, the I was talking about Milchemet Gogo Magog. Milchemet Gogo Magog. The Zohar is calling it Milchemet Gigim, the war of thoughts. I call it the war of screens, because everybody's glued to a screen. So some people they they find the excuse to look at a screen and they say, I'm looking at a Torah class for 20 minutes and then three hours of junk after the Torah class. So some people don't like going on YouTube and places like that because the suggested stuff on the sides, it's not moderated. And even the, sh the advertisements that they show you on, on YouTube, there's no connection to what you're seeing. So you see something and then the ad is totally not sneeze. So, excuse me? <coughs> exactly. It's exactly like that. And the, and the, the Yetzirah will trick a person to tell him, here, watch a 20-minute class and get inspired and you're doing now Limud Torah. But then just look at this recommended one and that one looks funny and this one looks good. And before you know it, you're 20 minutes learning Torah and three hours wasting on nonsense. So I also suggest not to go on these websites if you don't really need to. Not too long ago, I met a young man, and he told me, "I'm I'm very becoming very strong." And so I told him, "That's amazing. Where do you learn?" So he told me, uh, "I watch videos on YouTube." So I told him, "YouTube is not a yeshiva. You learn with a book. You don't learn on YouTube. YouTube is nice when you work or or you're doing something, and you don't have other options. You listen. But Torah, you learn with a book in a yeshiva. So." That's off the subject. Uh, first, before we start, I got a few emails that I got to publicly apologize. A lot of people email us, and they, in a, not in a negative way, but complain that the reply comes after two weeks. So I, I have to apologize that, Baruch Hashem, the popularity has grown, and we get about five to 800 emails every day. So we, I added another girl that processes all the emails. So. Don't, gonna, don't get offended if you send an email and the reply comes after a lot of time. So, Mezat Hashem, we're working on it, it will be much more efficient. But I got a few, not angry emails, but why, am, why, am, why are you not answering on demand? So, so Mezat Hashem, Hashem should help that it will be more efficient soon. So, Let's see how much time we have. We have a watch here? No. Okay. So we want to talk about many things today. I think what we'll do is we'll talk about the, till the time of Arvit, and then we'll make a break. And maybe before that we'll do some questions, or maybe after Arvit we'll do some questions. Yeah, but whatever you want. But the questions? Arvit, what's Arvit? Arvit, my What did you say? The questions you can ask whatever you want. No, but what did you say? We're going to talk about, I want to talk about a two, few topics, but the main topic I want to talk about is what's called Pesach Sheni. That in about a couple days we're going to celebrate the second holiday of Pesach. Now, it's a very weird holiday when you're thinking of it. Because why do we celebrate it? <coughs> okay, so the Torah tells us that whoever was impure, for whatever reason, could not offer the sacrifice of Pesach, Korban Pesach. Or, if a person was on the, on the way, on a journey, and he couldn't come 
to offer his sacrifice. So this is the basic explanation that whoever missed the opportunity, then a month later he has another opportunity to offer the sacrifice and fulfill the mitzvah. But the, the, the question here is why Dafka Pesach? Why isn't there a Sukkot Sheni? <laughs> What's the difference? Why isn't there a, a Rosh Hashanah Sheni? I didn't do tshuva real good enough on Yom Kippur or on another or Yom Kippur. Why Dafka Pesach? So the Arizal explains, and it's brought down by his Talmud, the, the uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital that there are three types of godly revelations. The lowest level of godly revelations comes from the sphera of Bina, which is what is, what is called Ima in the terminology of Kabbalah. And then there's a high level of godly revelation that comes from the sphere of Chochmah, so it's called Abba. And the highest level of godly revelation comes from the sphere of Keter, this is what's called Saba. Now each one of these godly revelations, they come in a certain time of the year, like an auspicious time. So this lower level of godly revelation that comes from Bina, that comes on Shabbos. Every Shabbat, that we have like this special godly revelation, He'ara. Now we don't really see it with our eyes. Very few tzaddikim actually see it with their eyes. That's another thing that we can't see also, but in Israel, Dafka in the in Eretz Israel that godly revelation is even more powerful. Some people are refined enough to see that it's different than here, than anywhere else in the world. But this godly revelation that comes from the sphere of Bina comes on Shabbat. Every Shabbat it comes. And if I prepare myself the entire week the right way, then when Shabbat comes, I can tap into this godly revelation, this He'ara Elokit, and I will derive from that a certain hamshacha, a certain energy, a certain enlightenment for the rest of the week. Needless to say that I'm going to be elevated with that light. As Darizal explains that on Shabbat they, all the worlds go up to their source. Anything that is not connected to the Shabbat stays down in the physical world. That's why we call when somebody desecrates Shabbat, we call it Chilul Shabbat. When I first became religious and I heard the term Chilul Shabbat, to lechalel in Hebrew is to take a flute and to... That's lechalel. So I was like, what's the connection? Lechalel Shabbat? Tell me. Lo lishmor Shabbat. Not to keep the Shabbat, not to observe the Shabbat. What's the connect? What's lechalel Shabbat? And then I understood that when the worlds go up on Shabbat to a higher level, Anything that grabs the Shabbat, it goes up with the worlds. And if somebody, chas v'shalom, does not grab the elevator, then is created a space between the physical world and the spiritual world. And a space in Hebrew is called halal. So there's a void now between the physical world and the spiritual world. Anybody who's not connected to the spiritual world by observing the Shabbat, then he's stuck in the space. So he's not here and not here. Therefore he's called Mechalel Shabbat because he's stuck in this halal, in this void. So one wants to constantly meditate on the fact that my entire week is a preparation for Shabbat. So every day we are ready when we pray, we say today is the Yom Yom Rishon Shabbat, Yom Yom Sheni Shabbat. Bechlal on already Wednesday we already start to prepare, we start reading Lechun Eranena. Our, my entire week has to be preparing for Shabbat. And if I'm not preparing for Shabbat the entire week, then I'm putting the gear in neutral and hitting the gas all the way to the, to the bottom and nothing happens, just noise. So my entire motion has to be preparing for Shabbat because if the light comes and I'm not prepared, then I miss it. That's why it's extremely important that Erev Shabbat, both men and women, they prepare the right way. Men go to the mikveh, they start preparing by reading Shtay Mikra Echa Targum. There's a mystical reason for that. You read many congregations, they read Shima Shir Hashirim. You do a lot of spiritual preparation. And it's extremely important that women prepare themselves the same way. Unfortunately, many women, they accept the Shabbat. No, 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 I have a, I'm in the 18 minutes. So that's not the right way to accept the Shabbat. Rather, the woman has to be already ready and showered and clothed and everything ready. I'm talking about maybe an hour before Shabbat so she can pray Mincha. 
and do her five, ten minutes of her meditation, whatever she, she, she focuses on, so she can be ready that when it's time to light the candles, she's already ready to observe this godly light because a woman comes from the sphere of Bina. And this is her specific light. So there are two levels that a woman can achieve. The lowest level is what's called Hei Tata'a, which corresponds to the last Hei of the name of Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, which the Kabbalah calls it Rachel. This is the lower level. And the highest level corresponds to the first Hei of the name of Yud Kei Vav Kei. This is Hei Ila'a, which is called Le'a. And our entire Avodah throughout the week is to do what's called Yichud, Yichud Zun, Connecting the Midot together so I can elevate the Hei Tata to the Hei Leah, merging Rachel and Leah together. And Leah is in the sphere of Bina. So a woman, by default, she has already a connection to that sphere. So by her preparing the right way and observing the Shabbat and meditating to wait for that moment, she's the one who can get that godly revelation. Therefore, that's why the woman has to accept the Shabbat. If the woman does not accept on Erev Shabbat, the Torah and the mitzvahs of her husband, and he stays outside. When the husband goes to, to, to shul, it's not only because there's a fighting in the house and they send the husband off, they just go, go. Rather, the husband goes to the shul, and if he does, it the, does what he needs to do the right way, on the way back, there are two angels that are, that are, are accompanying him, they're, they're taking him. That's why we sing when they come into the home, we sing Shalom Aleichem. Now one of the angels is the angel of Rachamim, and the other angel is Malach HaMavet, is the Samech Mem. They're both taking the husband home. To sidetrack to, to side a little bit, if you notice, mm -hmm. and it depends on many Nosachim, but I mean most of the Nosachim, when we sing Shalom Aleichem, we start with Shalom Aleichem, Malachi HaSharet, and then we say Boachem LeShalom, Baruchuni LeShalom, whatever the Nosach is, sometimes it's a change a little bit. Why the first one is Shalom Aleichem? Malachi HaSharet, and then we say Boachem, Baruchuni, and we say Malachi HaShalom, not Malachi HaSharet. Because if these two angels come into the home and they find candles lighting and a table set and chalot on the table and the house is ready for Shabbat, then the Samech Mem becomes Shalom, becomes Malachi HaShalom, from Malachi HaShalom. Because Malachi HaSharet is a general terminology of the Malachim. But Malachi HaShalom is the angels of peace. So that's why the first one we start Malachi Asharet, because it comes in two Malachim. But if the house is ready and the woman did whatever she was supposed to do, accepting the Shabbat the right way, and in her mind also accepting the Torah and the mitzvot that her husband generated the entire week, then the Samech Mem becomes one of the Malachi Shalom. And he then Baruchuni Shalom. after we say Boachem Shalom. So the woman has a very dominant power in Shabbat. Why? To tap into this godly light that comes from the sphere of Bina, that, that's her makor, that's her source. The second godly, godly revelation that comes from the sphere of Chochmah comes on Rosh Chodesh and on Yom Tov. And that doesn't happen so often, but that's a, a higher godly revelation. And the highest godly revelation that comes from the sphere of Keter comes once a year and that's on Lil Seder. The Rebbe from Kamarna explains that for each individual, one of these godly revelations is a certain love that gets aroused in our neshama. And he explains that we have three types of loves. So the godly revelation that comes from the sphere of Bina arouses in me a love that is called Ahavat Torah. That's why you see that on Shabbat, a person can be not so into learning Torah the entire week, but Shabbat comes suddenly... He enjoys learning Torah, he will pull out a book and suddenly he, 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 he will not go to sleep, he will not care if he's going to sleep, not going to sleep. You have this certain love for the Torah. And you see many men and also women, they, on Shabbat there's some type of awakening, to learn Torah. The Torah is sweeter on Shabbat. You understand it better. Because the godly revelation arouses the love for the Torah. The godly revelation that comes in Yom Tov and Rosh Chodesh, that comes from Sphira of Chochmah, arouses a love that is called Da'avat Hashem. That's why you see many people after Yom Tov, they're all hyped up, all inspired. Yom Tov leaves you like on, on, on uh, speeds. You're on a different level. 
Now you're like, okay, now I'm going to turn the world around. Doesn't matter, three, four weeks pass and all the air goes down. But you see that on the Yom Tov and on the Rosh Chodesh is a certain type of like energy that arouses in me the love to Kadosh Baruch Hu, Abad Hashem. But the godly revelation that comes down on Pesach, on Lel Seder, arouses a very special love that is called Avat Israel. And if a person observes the holiday of Pesach the right way, and prepares the right way, and celebrates the Lel Seder exactly how he's supposed to do, and sitting and eating and blessing and singing, etc., he taps into this godly light that comes once a year, Lel Shimurim, you see that we have customs not to lock the door, not we don't say Kriyat Shema. Why? It's a very special night. If a person does it the right way, then it arouses in him the love of what's called Avat Israel, and it empowers this love for him to stay for the entire year. Because unfortunately, most of us do not or did not reach yet to the level of real Avat Israel. Because to love another person exactly how I like myself, it's not an easy thing. And if we would reach to the level of Avat Israel, we would not be sitting here right now. We would be going to see Korban Atamid right now in Bet HaMikdash. We know the first Bet HaMikdash was destroyed from three sins. Idol worship, murder, bloodshed, and Giloy Arayot, forbidden relation. Since the sin was revealed, the length of the exile was revealed. When they left Jerusalem, the Navi, the Prophet told them, you're living for 70 years, and 70 years you're making a U-turn and coming back. And sure enough, 70 years later, they came back. 67 years later happened the whole story with Purim. It took them three years to pack their bags and come back. But the second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed from one sin that is called Sinat Chinam. And since the sin was not revealed, because you don't know if I like you or not, I can smile to you all day long, and, but I can hate you in my heart. Since the sin is not revealed, then the length of the exile is not revealed. And that's why we're still stuck in Gauls, because of Sinat Chinam. And if we would be able to bridge that and work on ourselves to a point that I have an unlimited love to another person, then I would be able to reach the level of what's called a personal gula, my personal redemption. First I have to go through one of the biggest obstacles loving myself. Because most of us don't even love ourselves the right way. Because if I would love myself the right way, I would only be close to Hashem. I would be davek with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, Because I would provide to my neshama exactly what, you, what my neshama needs. But forget about that love right now. We want to concentrate on Abat Israel. So on Pesach comes this godly light. And if I tap into it, then I have the power to, to, to work on my Abat Israel for the entire year. And this year was special. We got two at the same time, Shabbat and Lel Seder. So I got two godly revelations at the same time. So, why am I telling you this whole spiel? Because why are we celebrating Pesach Sheni? I want to celebrate Yom Kippur Sheni. It's not fair. The reason why we celebrate Pesach Sheni is because the Rizal explains that from Lel Seder, this godly light actually shines for 30 days. And I have 30 days to tap into it. That's why we start doing Sfirat Omer in, in that time. Because that's how I'm going to start refining myself. But this godly light lasts for 30 days till Pesach Shani. So I have 30 days to tap into it. And on the 30th day, it's not in the same level like it's shining on Lel Seder. But it's a very powerful godly revelation that one can tap into. That can allow me to, 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 to do tshuva. Because the entire world is based on tshuva. Now... When the Zohar is addressing the concept of Pesach Sheni, Zohar is explaining it a little bit different. It says, what are the two things that the person wanted or needed to do for Pesach Sheni? Either he was impure, was Tameh, or that he was Baderech, he was in, on the journey and he couldn't offer the sacrifice. So the Zohar is talking about, he's saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> The Zohar is talking about that these two levels are the two levels how a person lo sins. 
So a person that is in, a, in the madriga of the level of Tameh, it means that he did a certain avera and he brought impurity on him, Tum'ah. So now he's in the level of Tameh, he has to do Tshuva. Since he's the level of Tameh, of impure, he can't sacrifice a, a korban. More than that, he's not ready to leave Mitzrayim. He's not ready to go into freedom because he's trapped by the klipa. Because he did an Avera. Avera in Hebrew is a sin. But Avera comes from the word La'avor. La'avor mi reshut le reshut. Person chas v'shalom does the opposite will of Hashem. Then he moves himself from the domain of holiness. Mi reshut ha-kedusha le reshut ha-tuma. From one domain to the other domain. So he moves. Hu avar. From one side to the other. Until he will do tshuva, he can come back. So he's in a different domain. And how can you leave Mitzrayim if you didn't do tshuva yet? And the second level that it says that a person was in his journey, who was haya baderech, that's even a worse level of, of impurity, that a person did the Avera and he's repeating the Avera over and over and over, that he's so far away that he's considered baderech, he's on a journey, he's not even on the way to come even back. Now, a person doesn't need to be totally not keeping Torah and mitzvahs to fall into one of these categories. A person can do the majority of the Torah and mitzvahs and he's failing, he, she, same thing, in a certain thing that keeps repeating itself. And each individual has a couple of these that he can't break out. So the one that he does every here and there, okay, that's this level of tameh, impure. So you do tshuva, you reverse it. And these are things, things that, you know, once in a blue moon you have the opportunity and you, by mistake, knowingly, not knowingly, it doesn't matter. Not too long ago somebody came and asked me a question about a certain, a, a certain act. And he told me, is this considered like stealing? Is this a sagat? Well, a certain act, it doesn't matter. And I told him, yes, you can do that. If, if, you know, just to make, to, to make the point of it, he was asking me if he can, a, a friend of him asked him to buy him a phone in the United States and smuggle it into Israel because it's cheaper. And I said, yes, this is Gnevat Da'at, you can do that. You know how to do that. If you buy for yourself and you're saving money, you can do that. But to make a business out of it and to, to, to do it for somebody else, you know how to do that. So that was his question. But the thing is that this is, for example, he did it by mistake. He tell me, I have a feeling that I can't do that. The point is that this is not a, a, a sin that repeats itself constantly, a person that constantly lies or constantly fails in Lashon Ara. This is a one in, once in a blue moon thing. So we all have once in a blue moon things that we didn't know or, or we didn't pay attention or we really didn't know the old dinim in Halakha and we failed, okay. So I do tshuva. But I need to more concentrate on the ones that are making me stuck on this journey. Something that keeps repeating itself, and every individual has it. Because if you don't have it, then you're a tzaddik, or a tzaddiket. Now, I'm not saying it's bad right now. Don't look in the mirror and say, okay, I'm a rasha right now. This is not the point. The point is to, to recognize where is my weak point. Where am I not uh, succeeding to go out of my Mitzrayim? Now, Mitzrayim, even though in our days is considered a country, but Mitzrayim is a, is a state of mind. When the Torah is talking about Mitzrayim, yeah, it's talking about the country. But it's more talking about a state of mind that a person is in some type of a limitation. Mitzrayim comes from the word Meitzav, a limit. And if something limits me, then I'm in the state in, uh, of Mitzrayim, of, of something that limits me. I can't go, go out of my limitation. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. People sometimes tell me, but I'm, a, but I'm a good person. Okay, it's very good that you're a good person. It's very nice that you're a good person. That has nothing to do with it. You can be the best person, but you can still be stuck wherever you're stuck. It's like a wagon that, you know, four wheels, one of them goes into the mud. Three wheels are outside, but, you know, the one that is stuck in the mud makes the whole wagon stuck. One wheel. So sometimes 90% of my behavior is good. But I have 10% that is stuck in some type of a ditch and it pulls me back. It can't let me go out. The point is that everyone has to do his own assessment. Where, where, where am I holding? What is this limit that limits me? 
that doesn't allow me to go out of my limitation, that doesn't allow me to continue, to step forward, to go to a higher level. So a person has to do, you know, a self-assessment every, every day. That's why the first level of Tameh, impure, then you do, you do tshuva. Every day you do tshuva. Don't, you can't wait till Yom Kippur to do tshuva. People, somebody waits for Yom Kippur to do tshuva, I don't know how anybody can do tshuva on Yom Kippur. How can you do tshuva on one day for an entire year? How can you remember in Tishrei what you did 11 months before that in Kislev? How can you do tshuva for that? You can't. It's impossible. You remember some big things and that's it. Yom Kippur is like the, the, the end of the tshuva. People who wait the entire year to do tshuva on Yom Kippur, it's, it's pointless. You can't do tshuva for anything. Tshuva is not just sitting and davening and praying from a siddur and standing and starving yourself. A person needs to do everyday tshuva. So tshuva, the main, you know, the cycle closes on Yom Kippur. And then we have every Rosh Chodesh that we do tshuva for the entire month. Rosh Chodesh is called Yom Kippur Katan. Some congregations on Erev Yom Kippur, on Erev Rosh Chodesh, I'm sorry. Rosh Chodesh is considered Yom Kippur Katan. Some congregations, they fast on Erev Yom Kippur. It's Mamash a day of atonement. atonement. If you read in the Nosach of the Musaf of Yom Kippur, Yom Kapara, it's a day of Kapara, it's a day, day of atonement. People think it's just uh, another day in the calendar. It's another Yom Kippur that you have. So we don't have a Pesach Sheni, a Yom Kippur Sheni. We have 12 Yom Kippurs. Every Rosh Chodesh I can do Tshuva for the entire month. And it's an auspicious time that Tshuva will get accepted. And every Friday I do Tshuva for the entire year. For the entire week. That's why I said before that you want to light the candles not in the 18 minutes and the, the, the kitchen is still a mess. You want to light your candles when you are dressed and bathed and ready and relaxed after you prayed. Now I'm talking for the women, the men for sure, the men is not even a question. Why? So you can pray mincha and then you can do tshuva and you sit 10 minutes and you go in your mind, what did I do this week? Was I a good wife? Was I a good mom? Was I a good neighbor? Maybe I owe somebody money, maybe I insulted somebody. You gotta do tshuva. Maybe I owe somebody money, I don't know. Then you can accept the Shabbat. You cannot accept Shabbat if you have a little bit of, of, of dirt, spiritually. And then every night you do tshuva on your own, Kriyat Shema Lamita. If a person doesn't finish the day with Kriyat Shema Lamita, then so many things happen if a person doesn't finish the day with Kriyat Shema Lamita. Kriyat Shema Lamita is not a minhag. And women are also obligated to say Kriyat Shema Lamita. It's how you finish your day. And if you finish the day the right way, then you open the next day the right way. And if you don't finish the day the right way, you're going to sleep all dirty, then that's how a person will wake up in the morning. Because he didn't clean himself. May I ask a question? For sure. Okay, on that dead time Shema, there was a little question as to what you meant from my readers. So you mean the dead time Shema in the sea door? Of course. To say it. Okay, so if you could just clarify that. There are different... Sorry, there are different type of, of uh, nosachim. They're a little bit different from each other. The point is that a person has to do two actions before they go to sleep. The first one is, is to do tshuva. It's to sit on the bed, or in the couch, or in the shul, and make a, an account what I did today. And to do tshuva. Now, if you want me, uh, you know, I'll back up two steps. We know that our soul is built from five madrigot, from five levels. The highest level of the soul is called Yechida. Yechida comes from the word Yichud. People think it's come from the word Yechid. There's only one that is Yechid and it's only the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Yechida comes from the word Yichud. Yichud is a unity. Like a bride and groom, they go to Yichud room. It's the ultimate unity. So the highest level of the soul is called Yechida. Why? It's because it's totally united with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. It's Chalek Elokai. It's a piece of Hashem. The next level of the soul is called Chaya. Now Chaya is what's called, people call it in English, Aura. It's a Or Makif, it's a surrounding light. It's a very high level of our Neshama, it doesn't penetrate into the body. This is what's called Tselem. Tselem is the godly figure of the soul. But Tselem Elohim Nivra Adam. With the shape and the image of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the, the man was created. The fact that we have hands and a head and a body and legs, it's because the spiritual structure of our soul has a head and a body and hands and legs and so forth. 
that Selim holds in it thousands and thousands of godly sparks and every spark that is in this godly piece of the soul that Selim corresponds to one day that a person would live in this world. So if a person lived till the Tselem, in the Tselem, the second level of the Neshama, it's called Chaya, but it's also called Tselem. Tselem is a godly image. In the Tselem, there are thousands of thousands of godly sparks, building it like a puzzle. Imagine a puzzle in your mind, a thousand piece puzzle. If one piece is missing, then the puzzle is not complete. So you see a picture, but imagine in your mind like a jigsaw puzzle, many, many, many pieces. So the Tselem is built from many, many, many pieces. And it's built from as many as pieces as the days of our life. So if a person lives till the age of 60, calculate how many days is 60 years, do 365 days a year plus the leap year or whatever, calculate the time, you'll come, the amount you'll come, this is the amount of godly sparks that that soul had to elevate in this life. So you're talking about 20, 30, 50,000 uh, godly sparks. And you can only elevate one in a day. And if you didn't elevate it that day, then the next day you have two. And if you didn't do it the next day, you have the next day three and so forth. And if Chas Shalom, a person doesn't complete his life, because if a person comes down to the world and in the plan he's getting 72 years, and through the 72 years he will do a, a few acts, a few severe sins, that the reaction will be what's called mita bidei shamayim, death by the heavenly courts, a person mechalel shabbat, desecrates shabbat, mita bidei shamayim, he's chayav mita. If a person lives a life a certain way, then his life can be cut in half. He was supposed to live till 70, he died when he was 50. Now he's going to have to come back in a reincarnation with a death already for the new life and the old life. So as many as godly sparks that I have in my chaya, that's as many as days that I have in this world. And every day I have to refine one of them, a certain avoda, a certain act that I have to do in this world, and then I take this spark up to Shamayim. And I take it when I go to sleep. This is why God created sleep. Because other than that, it's a waste of time. When you're thinking of it, we, we, we waste thir a third of our life on a bed. It's a waste of time and it's a waste of space. If we wouldn't have to sleep, we wouldn't need so many rooms in the house. It's really, when you think of it, look at the tzaddikim, they never slept. Darizal never slept. He would take like little naps, he put his head down for one, two minutes, up, oh, come up. Yeah, many. Bar Shem Tov. So, a tzaddik doesn't go to sleep. He closes his eyes for one or two minutes and that's it, and he gets recharged. And so we're not Sadiqim, we have to go to sleep. But the going to sleep, when you're looking at it in a, in a very clear way, it's a waste of time. Why do I need to sleep? Let me sleep for 10 minutes. Third of my life I'm wasting on a sleep because that's when I'm taking this spark up to Shemaim. Now in order for me to take that spark that I did that day up to Shemaim, there's a whole ceremony. I have to pray every day to, to pat, pave me the path that the Neshama will go up that day. Now to make a long story short, because I don't want to do a class about that, but if I do not do tshuva that night, and I did a sin that day, I, my neshama can't go up. Imagine the neshama like a hot air balloon. And it's, hold, it's, it's, it's holding to the ground with these big sacks of sand. If the, if the weight is holding it down, it can't go up. So if the neshama needs to go up to ascend to a higher world to take this godly spark that night, and there's one sin that is holding the neshama down, the neshama can't go up. So the person goes to sleep, and instead of the neshama going, what's going up to what's called the base din of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the heavenly court of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, if the person did shuva the right way that night, then the soul goes up to the heavenly court and gets rejuvenated like a cell phone at the end of the night. You, 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 you plug it in. So the battery will be full the next day. Can I ask the second part of my question? Wait, wait, let me finish with that. Okay. I, if you don't mind, I'd rather continue and then we'll, we'll get more into questions. But since we started talking about Kiachma, I'll just try to make it more, more clear. So if I didn't do Tshuva that night, my Neshama doesn't go to the right place. And that's why you see many people that they go to sleep and they wake up in the morning like a Shmate. They wake up in the morning depressed, sa sad, lazy, heavy, I slept bad, I slept for 10 hours, I barely moved. 
And sometimes you see people, the same individual will go to sleep for three, four hours. It wakes up like a Sorry, tiger. But do we have to do that exact prayer from the book? Yeah. Or can we do You have to do both. No, because I have trouble. I tried it from watching one of your tapes. And so I, I don't like doing it. So what I do is I just sincerely pray to God. No, you have to do both. When our sages, right when our sages compile the prayer, right. it's not to annoy us. When our sages sat down with Ruach HaKodesh, any Siddur that was written, was written by Ruach HaKodesh. It's not some bunch of guys, let's say, okay, let's write some poems. Whoever compiled the Siddur sat with, I don't like saying the word Holy Spirit because the non-Jews use it, because, but Ruach HaKodesh is a divine level. They wrote every word is calculated on the letter. And there's a reason why we say that. The easiest way to explain why we say that is imagine now a safe. Now remember the old-fashioned safes? You had to turn it to the left, 17, then turn to the right, 32. You had a combination, right? Mm -hmm. You're missing one digit. It's not going to open the safe. So we have to do it in Hebrew. Yes. Oh, okay. If you don't mind, maybe we'll do all the detailed questions uh, later. But better to do it in Hebrew. Kriyat Shema itself, you want to do in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekan Shem Echad. But anything that has to do with prayer, you have to understand what you're saying. So if you don't understand Hebrew, you do it in, you do it in English. I'll give you later some more details. I don't want to delay the entire class. But the point is that the prayers that we do are combinations to open a safe. And if I miss one digit, the safe will not open. It's almost like not too long ago, somebody was trying to, 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 send, to send me an email. And he wasn't really computer savvy. And he kept telling me, I'm sending you messages and you ever, never answer me. And I told him the same thing what I told you before. There's a lot of emails coming in. He's like, no, 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 it's months already. So I told him, what is the email that you're sending it to? So he's telling me the, the email, then this at and gmail.com. So I told him, yeah, but you have to put a dot between the gmail and the com. He's like, okay, a dot, big deal. I told him that because this dot, it's not coming through. So one little dot, you miss, the email doesn't come through. So this is exactly prayer. You're missing one word. It's not going to go through. So whatever our sages compile to us is exactly measured on the letter. You cannot take shortcuts. And the fact that you're not happy or you don't like it, that that's, that's, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Yes, you should do both from the Sidhu, from the prayer book, and with your heart, with your words. I think maybe she's asking if, if you want to start somewhere. You want to, if you want to start, you start with your words. Are you talking about to start that night or to start Bechlal? No, every night I was doing it to get rid of the bad dreams that I was having. And uh, the bad dreams went away, but I began to I totally dislike having to do it. <laughs> That's your Yetzirah telling you I don't like so you. I started to just like pray to God with so much Kavana from my heart, not to see door with the same type of prayers. Okay. But instead, as a, uh, instead of. So it's not instead. It's almost like taking a man now and telling him, don't put filling on. Sit like this for an hour and meditate that you're putting filling on. So he can have the best Kavanot. The best intention, but he didn't put the tefillin on. So the, the intentions are worthless. He has to do an action. He has to has the, have the kavanot. You have to have both. But more important is the action. Hamaseh waikal. The action is the, is, is the bottom line. Yes, you have to have your intention. The right way to do kriyat shmalamita is to take five minutes and to sit down. And the best way is to take a piece of paper and to write down what I did today. I lied. I cheated. I gossiped, I looked the wrong way, I answered back, I said a not nice word, you write it down. Do that every day, you'll find out a very long list. But you want to find out that list so you know what to reverse, what to, to, to fix, so you can apologize to the right person. Maybe you owe somebody money, might be, might be two shekels, but you still owe that person money. Maybe you said something wrong to somebody. Maybe you did in some type of a way, gezel, you took something that doesn't belong to you. We're not, we're not Sadiqim, we're human beings. 
But if I'm not going to do this Cheshbon Nefesh, I'm not going to do this account every day, how am I going to do Tshuva when it comes Yom Kippur? I'm going to have like bags of things to start remembering what I did. So the right way to do Kriyat Shema Lamita is you take five minutes out of your day. 20. You can take half an hour. Some people do an hour. Instead of three, three hours on Facebook, then you have half an hour on Facebook. And one hour you do it, but you do it, and you, and, you, and you do tshuva. It depends on the individual. Look, some people don't need to do so much cheshbon nefesh. The, the day is pretty clear. The, this is not the point. The point is, so we can move on, a person has to do an account at the end of the day. He has to be honest with himself, so he can point, okay, what am I doing not good? The reason why you might, you know, your yetzer go, woke up, is because the Yetzirah doesn't want you to clean the home. He's happy when there's a lot of schmutz. Why should you start cleaning things around? And when a person looks inside himself to start refining himself, then it means he will start throwing out all the dirt. The Yetzirah is not happy with that. So he's going to make you feel uncomfortable with the, with the prayer book and tell you you are a very good woman, just pray with your covenant. He's just tricking you so you're not going to clean out the dirt. But the bottom line, one needs to clean the dirt at the end of the night to do tshuva, because if he does it, the soul will go up to the heavenly court, will deliver that spark that he refined that day, will get rejuvenated, and wake up in the morning, what's called briya chadasha, a new creation, with new energies. You're looking at it, it's a very weird thing. You go to sleep, you're totally tired. And then you sleep, and you wake up after five, six hours, ten hours, whatever. Kochot mechudashim, renewed powers. Why? Not because the body needs the rest. The neshama needs the rest. Our body technically can go without, can go without rest. Technically. But, if you want, you can more center it. So, Kriyat Shema Lamita is a very important part of our day because the person ends the day the right way and if you clean yourself, you do tshuva at the end of the night, then first you elevate that spark up to Shemaim in the right way. B, like you said, no nightmares, no anxieties, no fears, no all sorts of issues. Uh, you, you don't want to deal with it because at night the body is thrown on the bed and all these, you know, mazikim, which, you know, you can explain it, you know, some people explain it as, 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 as an external part, like something spiritual, like spirits and whatever. They come and they want to bite the kedusha, the holiness of the body. Because you're generating Kedushah the whole night, generating holiness. So you want to surround the body. But we made I don't want to do a Shior on Kriyat Shmona Mita. Later on you can ask me some more questions. But the thing is that this is the most important part of the day. If a person has to concentrate on something, is how he finishes the day. Because the way you set your bed at the end of the night, that's what's going to happen at night when your Neshama goes up to Shemaim. That's how you're going to wake up in the morning. You're going to wake up with the right thoughts. You're not going to wake up heavy and depressed or sad or lazy or all these things. That's stopping us from jumping out of bed in the morning. But the point is that, I, that a person needs to live in tshuva every day. And if a person every day does tshuva, comes Yom Kippur, all he needs to do, he needs to fast. And pray and give a little bit of charity and that's it. He did already tshuva the whole year. Now why, what's the whole concept of tshuva? It's because the reality is that we constantly sin. And it's tzaddik asher ba'aretz There's no such a thing that we're not going to sin. There's a reason why in the system we have sins. Because Hashem wants to constantly elevate us to a level of about tshuva. So if, I'm, if I don't sin, how am I going to do tshuva? So the, the system of sinning, the option of sinning, because Hashem could build it in a way that there wouldn't be an option of sinning. But there's a reason, there's a more deep explanation and understanding for the sin. You know when you miss something is when you don't have it. You appreciate your husband, you appreciate your wife when they go away for like a week or two. You appreciate and you miss what you have when you don't have it. So Hashem sometimes creates a situation so you can miss Him. What if? What if? Or it. What do you mean or it? Oh, you mean about Hashem? Miss Him. Okay, I'm calling Him Him right now. No, I'm referring to that Hashem constantly wants our attention. If Hashem would, want, would not want our attention, He would leave us alone. Hashem constantly, you know, the, the Zohar compares it to like a king that had a, a, a son. And he told his son, I'm going to give you every year a certain amount 
of money so you can sustain yourself. And the son would come once a year, take the check, say hello, and leave. And the, son, the king didn't like it because the son would come once a year. So then he told his son, you know what, I'm going to give you the exact same amount. But in increments of every day you have to come and get your check. So the son, for the son is just getting the money. But the king wants to see the son every day. So the Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to see us every day. He wants our attention. If we would have everything, trust me, you wouldn't pray. You wouldn't cry. You wouldn't ask. Everything, I have everything. Why should I bother to pray? So Hashem makes sure that I have a reason to pray. And Hashem makes sure that He gets my attention in many different ways. And if Hashem doesn't get my attention, He will make sure He gets my attention. So if I want to not get these calls of getting the attention, then give the Hashem a lot of attention. That's it. That's what Hashem wants. He just wants our attention. So Hashem creates situations that I will feel the lack of closeness to Hashem. This is called a sin. So then I can wake up and be like, okay, now I'm missing my, my father. I miss my source. I don't have connection to my source. So I feel this void in me, this sadness, etc., etc. So the point is, going back to the concept of Pesach Shani, is constantly to bring me to do tshuva. Is constantly that I would reflect inside me and work on myself. Because the main reason why we came down to this world, well, there's many reasons, but one of the main reasons and the, the things we have to do in this world is called Avodat Amidot, Tikkun Amidot. Because Torah and Mitzvahs we're all obligated in doing, all the Jews are the same. There's no difference between one Jew to the other. We're all obligated in the same mitzvot. There are a few groups in our nation, they have more mitzvot, like priests. When Bezat Hashem we have it Amikdash, so they have more mitzvot than the Levim and the Israel. But in general, all the Jews are the same. I have to keep Shabbat, the rest of the Jews in the world have to keep Shabbat. There's no difference between one and the other. I have to eat kosher, you have to eat kosher. The Torah and mitzvahs that a Jew, that a Jew does, it's the air and the food for the soul. The same way that you eat food and you breathe air every day and you do not deprive your body from air and food, your soul needs air and food, that's it. You're going to start depriving your soul from getting its food, the soul is going to start bothering you. If you're not going to eat for five hours, you're going to get a stomach ache. Then you're going to not eat for eight hours, you get a headache. Then you don't eat for 12 hours, you start feeling weak. And the more you deprive your body from food, it will start reacting. And I don't know anyone that can deprive his body from breathing. I've never seen anyone who says, okay, one minute we're not breathing. <gasps> Nobody does it. It's built in an automatic system that you just breathe. But take away air for one minute, person chokes. So our body constantly needs two things to, be, to, to, to sustain itself, food and air. So the neshama needs food and air. It needs Torah. It needs mitzvahs, it needs to daven. You deprive your neshama from its food, it will bother you. So one person, it will bother them with sadness. Another person, it will bother them with depression. Another person, it will bother them with sickness. And all sorts of issues. And we're looking at Shemaim and like wondering, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Well, I'm such a good person, why is this happening? Your neshama is reacting. Your neshama is screaming to you, Hello! You didn't give me food for a whole week. So... The neshama needs Torah and mitzvahs. But our main avodah that we came down to this world is to refine our nefesh abemit. This is called tikkun midot. Because our midot belongs to our attributes, belong to the nefesh abemit. And my mochin, my intellect, belongs to the nefesh elokit. We have two nefeshot in our body. Before I, I stopped, I told you the highest level of our neshama is called yechida. Then comes the tselem, the, the chaya. And then we have neshama, ruach, and nefesh. These three parts are in our body. The neshama is, the, is so holy, it doesn't penetrate completely into the body. It has to be dressed in garments in order to move the body. Because it's a spiritual being, it can't move a hand. So the neshama gets dressed in garments. And it has to get dressed into the nefesh. And the nefesh is the lowest part of the neshama and that actually moves the body. And it gets dressed in the levushim of th thought, speech, and action. So our thoughts and our speech and our action is controlled by our nefesh. But the nefesh, we have two of them. We have a nefesh elokit. This constantly wants to run after good things and do mitzvot and learn Torah and do good acts. And never to lie and never to steal and never to cheat. And this 
gets its, its sustenance from what's called the mochin, from chokhmah bina and dat. But the midot, our attributes, belong to the nefesh of a behemit. Behemit comes from the word behema, like an animal, because our attribute is like an animal. So we want to eat, we want to enjoy food, and we want to enjoy sleep, and we want to enjoy the, the, what the world can offer me. So this part of the neshama is constantly looking for physical enjoyments, physical pleasures, and it will pull you for the physical pleasure. The nefesh elokit, exactly like the story with Yaakov and Esav, that every time Rivka would pass next to the Bet Midrash, then Yaakov wanted to go out. He, he, he represents the Nefesh Elokit. He wanted to be close to the Torah. But every time she went next to a house of worship, of Chas Shalom idol worship, then Esav wanted to go out. In our body, the Yaakov in our Neshama, the Nefesh Elokit, it constantly wants to do good things. He wants to go to a Torah class right now. But the Nefesh Abemit constantly will pull you to negative things and it will recognize the negative things. The Nefesh Abemit will recognize something that will give you a physical pleasure and will distort the reality to make you think that this is the right thing to do right now. So the Nefesh Abemit will tell you, you don't need to pray now for 40 minutes. Why don't you go and enjoy a bath for 40 minutes? A nice warm bath with bubbles. And it will relax you. So the Nefesh Abemit is going to look how to, to, to entertain you physically. And it will make sense. It will bring you the, the, the situation in a very clear way that his argument is better. The Nefesh Elokit will constantly pull to its way. So we come here to this world to refine our Midot. Now the Midot are called attributes. And it's the, the, divided into two groups. One of them is called character. In, in Hebrew it's called Ofi. Now the character that we're born with, we cannot change. You cannot change somebody's character. Don't even try to change anybody's character. Not your husbands, not your kids. That's their character. Then comes the midot, the attributes, and they come to refine the character. Now a midah in Hebrew is also a, not only an attribute, midah is also a measurement or a quantity. So I can take a certain attribute, like the attribute of chesed, of kindness, of love, and apply it to one of my character traits. And, and then I use the measurement, how much kindness I'm adding into it, and I can refine with this my character. So to give you one very extreme, to one point, a person can be the ultimate chesed, ultimate just wants to give. But it's so out of control that the attribute of chesed is so dominant that a person will go and help a terrorist that just did try to kill somebody. The mita of chesed is out of control. That he wants to do something wrong, he wants to help a person, but it's the wrong, it's, it's the wrong person to help, but the mita, the, the attribute is out of control. Whatever, I don't want to say names, or I'm just say, giving an example how sometimes a, an attribute is out of control. I think that is exactly what they do. They think they're so here it's a good example of saying their ofi, their character, is to be very giving. But the mida of chesed is so out of control that they do the chesed to the wrong place. Instead of taking the, the, ac the action, the, the, the motion of gvura, of severity, and stopping the chesed and saying, okay, here I can give chesed, here I can do kindness, here I cannot do kindness. So you see the Dafka people who are very far away from Torah and mitzvahs, they don't have a control over their, uh, of their attributes, of their character. So it's directed to completely different, the wrong ways, and in a very extreme way. Because there's no control over the ofi, of the character. So I don't want to sidetrack too much about that, but the point is that we came here to refine our midot, to refine our attributes. And the only way to do it is only if I would look in me to recognize my faults. Yes, I know you want to ask a question. Oh, you did? I thought you forgot. I don't forgot. It's just it's distracting me when I stop for questions. Oh, so should I not? not you know, if it has to do with, the, with what I'm... You just didn't understand with, with doing something good and then killing somebody. No, what I, was, what I meant... I didn't understand. I meant that every person has a certain character. Like I like giving. A person can have a character, 
his character traits, his giving, his loving, his compassion, his merciful. There's a long list of characters. But you can be unbelievable giver. But if this giving is out of control, you have to know who to give, how much to give. You can give your entire money. You have to have a certain measurement. I can only give you 10% of my money. I would want to give you 20, but I don't have that your money. Out of a job, right? Forget about that right now. I'm just saying how you're how you controlling your character. Right. A, per, a lot of people, they don't have control over their character. So right. a person can be extremely merciful. He can't see even a, a, a worm suffering. And that individual will see a, a terrorist on the floor. He, he was just was shot. He will have compassion to that person because his character of being merciful is out of control. So he will have mercy on, on the complete wrong person. And if he doesn't have control over his character, by adding an attribute of what's called gvura, of severity, of stopping it, saying, okay, that person I can't have mercy on. I have to have mercy on that person. So sometimes your character is out of control. If your character is out of control, a person can give all his money away. I know certain people that they're so generous, they give more money than what they have. So their character is not monitored. It has to be monitored by a different type of attribute that is called gvura, severity. Stop it. You have to refrain. Gvura is refraining. Chesed is giving. So all our character traits have to be under control. And if I don't control my character traits, then I'm, I'm totally not doing what I'm supposed to do. Therefore, I have my character traits. That's my, that's my character. I cannot change my character. If you're a giver, you'll always be a giver. And if somebody will try to prevent you from giving, you'll have inner pain. You're not going to be able to sleep because you can't give. You didn't give enough that day. But you have to use your emotions, your, char your, your, your attributes to control it. I'm giving you one example out of many. The point is what I'm trying to say. The point what I'm trying to say is that we have our character and it's not directed the right way. Because if it would be directed the right way, I would only do the will of the Kadosh Baruch of the will of Hashem. Because everything comes down to this world, it manifests from the ten sfirot. So the highest sfirah I told you is called Keter. Keter is a crown. The crown is holding all the information. That's the DNA of the soul. And then it will start manifesting into the Sfirot. The highest character trait, the, the power of the Sfirah of Keter is called Ratzon. Ratzon means a will, a desire. That's what motivates me to do things. If I don't have a Ratzon, I'm not going to do nothing. If I don't have a desire to do something, I will not do nothing. I will be numb. The Ratzon Molid, it, it gives birth to what's called Machshava, thought. So is it it's not about the spirit, this is called Ratzon. Ratzon is a desire, a will to do something. Now there are two types of Ratzonot. There's your Ratzon, which is the wrong will, and there's the Kadosh Bechuz, Ratzon Elyon. You have to tap into the, what Hashem wants you to do. So it's a Ratzonot. Exactly. And I'm going to give you an example in a second, but I want to first finish that from the Ratzon, Ratzon will give birth to Machshava, to a thought. And the machshava, the thought, will give birth to pleasure, tanug. And we are built in such a way that we're constantly searching for pleasures. Doesn't matter right now, physical or spiritual, but our, our system is based on the fact that we're constantly running after pleasures. Tanugot. And Hashem created it in that way. Ratzon leads to thought. Ratzon will, will, ratzon will birth a, a thought. How is that? I'll tell you in a second. And the thought will, will birth pleasure. Now I'll give you an example. You can look at it the complete, you know, we'll give, I'll give you a different example. I have now a thought. I, I want to have a nice car. Okay? Where is this thought coming from? It's coming from a desire, from a ratzon, to drive a nice car, because I just saw my neighbor has a nice car. So my thought will activate certain powers in me to go and pursue this pleasure because ultimately why do I want a nice car because it will give me pleasure driving in a nice car and it will give me pleasure that the, the entire the entire neighborhood looks at me and I have the nicest car out there so my ratzon my ultimate will gives birth to a thought how am I getting this car 
Why? Because I want to get pleasure. Now, is this the right ratzon? No. It's my ratzon. It's my desire. So ultimately, the pleasure that I got, a momentarily pleasure from a piece of metal, is a fake pleasure. It's an empty vessel. The result will be, I have a pleasure for a, an hour from a good meal. I have a pleasure for two hours from a movie. I have a pleasure one week from a vacation. But all the pleasures that come from the wrong place are very uh, uh, limited. Then the pleasure disappears. Exactly. Well, that's a much higher level. I'm talking right now in very low level that a person is constantly running after his retzonot, his desires, because he wants to fulfill certain pleasures. Why? Because he's empty. His vessel is empty, so he feels emptiness and sadness. It will manifest into low self-esteem, all, all sorts of issues that we're dealing with. Why? Because my vessel is inflated and it's empty. There's nothing there. Why? Because I'm constantly running after the wrong desires. It's exactly what you quoted. Make your will his will. Now, if I want to find the ultimate happiness, it's only by me searching the, what is the will of the Kadosh Baruch that's the only way I'm going to get the real happiness into my life because I'm going to build vessels and fill them up with the right lights. The point of all this explanation is that if I'm constantly focused on my own will, I'll never do what I'm supposed to do in this world. I'll never do it. And I'll keep coming here in reincarnations over and over because I did not do my part in this world. I constantly have to meditate. What does God want for me? And the only way to meditate what God wants for me is only if I talk to my soul so my soul can answer me. Because nobody will answer you that. Not any rabbi, not any nobody. Nobody can answer you. People go to rabbis, they pay them thousands of shekels, dollars, whatever. They're all sorts of fake people. Nobody can tell you. You're the only one who can tell, the only one who can tell you what you really need to do is only your neshama. Because the neshama is connected to the Kadosh Bacho. And the only way to do it is to talk to your neshama and wait for the neshama to talk back. But the Torah was passed from Rabbi to Tamiris. Okay, that's the explanation how to serve Hashem and how to walk on the path to fulfill Hashem's desire. Right now I want to know what Hashem wants from me. You have to wake up in the morning and tell to the Kadosh Baruch Hu after you say, Modiani, what do you want from me today? I know you want me to pray and learn Torah, but what, do you, what is my Avodah today? What do you want from me? Nobody will give me this answer, even the Torah. The Torah will give me tools how to get it. The Torah will give me tools how to center myself that I can go on the right path. But in order for me to know what I'm supposed to do, I have to talk to my soul. Talking to my soul, this is called filah, praying, to pray. And women also have to pray. There's no exempt from, exemption for women. Women have to pray at least once a day. I'm talking from a sidu, from a book, not uh, so in your mind. No, no. You have to pray shacharit, mincha, arvit, one of them. No. It's hard for you? Yes. One. I said, or shacharit, or mincha, or arvit. One of them. If you want to beautify and overpower and you bring more power, you can do three filot a day. You can bench. That's also considered filah. Same birkat amazon. No. 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 You have to do, a woman has to do either shacharit or mincha or arvit, one of the three, whatever she wants. Better to do shacharit. If it's hard for you, then do mincha. That is not, that's, one, that's another thing. It's like paying Arnona and paying rent. It's two separate things. <laughs> you, can't pay, you can't do one or the other. Keep me busy. Yes. So the point is that why do we do tefillah? Because that's how I center my neshama and that's how I start, my neshama will start talking to me. But I have to follow a few other patterns. I have to do what's called hitbodedut. Hitbodedut is not running in a field and screaming. Hitbodedut means that it's levoded. I have to isolate my nefesh. Bidud HaNefesh. This is what's called Hidbodidut. Hidbodidut is that I take myself and I isolate myself from, the sur from my surrounding. Phone shuts off, no computers, no nothing. Just me, that I can s isolate my Neshama. Bidud HaNefesh. That I, why? So I can start talking to my Nefesh. And don't think you're crazy if you start talking to yourself. No. Dominating and giving No, no. Again, it's like drink, just drinking water the whole day. Hold on for just one second. A person, in order to know exactly what he needs to do in this world, he needs his neshama to start talking to him. And you need to make a connection to your neshama. 
Forget about now the prayers and this. Now I'm talking about something completely different. A person needs to find five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour a day that he isolates himself from this world. That he can talk to his neshama, her neshama, so the neshama can answer back. This is called idbolidut. This is not, a, not, not, not such an extreme thing. You can do idbolidut on the bus. You don't need, if you can meditate, you can isolate yourself. And you do another level, it's called hitbonenut. This is more meditating, there's, there's more practice to do that. This is not what I want to teach tonight. The point is that one needs to reach to a level that he's, he knows what he's supposed to do. He knows what's his tikkun. I know what I'm supposed to do in this world. My days are not wasted. Why? Because I constantly have to achieve a certain thing in this world. The basic things, praying and this, this is basic things. It's eating and drinking. That's what I said before. It's air and food. So you have to pray once a day. Reading Tehillim is amazing. You have to do that. But it doesn't overpower something else. It doesn't say if you mean, read 10 chapters of Tehillim that you don't have to say Kriyat Shmona Mitah. It's two separate, completely separate things. You have a certain agenda you need to do a certain day. You have a capacity. You go to work now. Your boss tells you you're working from 8 to 5. And I'm going to pay you a certain amount of money. And if you come from 8 to 4, I'm reducing your salary. In the spiritual world, you're just lacking something. So you don't, it's not about pay. It's what you're lacking. So I have an agenda. I have what to do this day. And if I don't do it, I'm wasting a day. And the next day, I'll have double to do it. And then the next day, I'll have triple to do it. I, don't want, it, I want it to be the last round. I don't want to come here back anymore, anymore. Besides the fact Mashiach is coming, there's no time now to take to consideration. I'll come in another Gilgul. So every day now is extremely important. Well, what happens if you brought other, a lot of Jews back? There's nothing to do with it. It doesn't negate or cancel out your own responsibility? No. It's literally what you're saying now is equivalent to saying, I'm going to feed now a thousand people. A thousand people I'm going to feed. But today I'm not eating. So a thousand people are full, but you're starving. So the fact that you feed a thousand people is unbelievable, but it doesn't overpower or fulfill what you're supposed to do. It's an amazing mitzvah. It's unbelievable. But you still have to worry about yourself. You have to do, you have to give your neshama its sustenance. So this is one thing. This is your daily avodah. But mainly I need to know what am I doing in this world? Because if I wasted a day, it's a day that will pass. And, I, and it's lost. And the next day I'm going to have to work double hard. And this is the concept of tshuva. This is Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni, maybe it's marked as Yudalet Iyar. But Pesach Sheni is the fact of doing tshuva. Is the fact that I have to move myself out of my meitzar. Out of my limitation. I have four wheels in my wagon. Look at these huge trucks. 18 wheels. One wheel is stuck in the mud, the whole truck, the whole wagon is stuck. So you can be performing 95% good, but 5% is still stuck in the mud. You have to concentrate on that 5%. And this is what you need to take from tonight, is the fact that every day, and we're not Siddiquim, we do a lot of bad things. Why? So I can refine it. So I can work on it. And then when I work on that, I'm done with that, I'm going to move to the next step. And I move to the next step. And when I read tons of Tehillim and feed a thousand people, it will give me a lot of koach to do it. But I still have to do the actual work. And I have to do everything together. Now, if I don't know what I need to do, if I'm not focused on my, uh, my job, then, then I, can, I can do a lot of good things, but I'm not, I, I'm not concentrating, I'm not putting my effort on the right thing. And my entire daily avodah is to, first of all, concentrate on what I need to do. So when our sages told us you have to open a book and read from it and to pray, 99% of our nation don't like to pray. Because they don't know what it means. And they don't tap into the power of prayer. When a person reaches to the level that he understands what prayer does to him and he actually feels it, he, she, same thing, then they want to go and pray. The majority of mo most people, they just do it, they're just accepting the yoke and okay, I gotta go. It's better doing it like this and not doing it at all. But the point is that prayer is like your, your IV, your, your neshama gets a boost. But if you say it in Hebrew and you don't understand it, don't we get the merit as if, uh, like it's 
the halacha. No, the halacha is the halacha is that you have to understand what you're praying. The only thing that you have to say in Hebrew is Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. And there are certain things that you have to say in Hebrew. But if I would now offer you a job that pays a million dollars a month, you would say, oh, I, I, "I want that job." Doesn't matter what it is. I said, "Okay, the term to get this job is the factory is based in Brazil. I need you to learn Portuguese." It will take you half, an hour, half a year to learn the language. You still want the job? Uh, yeah, of course I want the job. I'll go learn the language to make a million dollars a month. So Hashem tells you, I'm giving you a million dollars a second. You want to learn my language? So about that, somebody who understands goes and learns the language. Now, I'm not telling to you now to leave your entire agenda and learn Hebrew. But if I want to serve Hashem the right way, I have to serve Hashem. I, I need to learn the language. So... Any person that wants to connect to Hashem the right level, so he takes it every day. He learns one pasuk and, and learns here another pasuk. The reality is that most people don't even know what they read. They read it, they can even understand the Hebrew, they don't understand. There's different books. One of the books is called Perusha Milot. It dissects the words. You understand what you're actually saying. So certain things you can say, you can only say in Hebrew. But you have to understand your prayer. So if you don't know Hebrew yet, then you pray in English. Shema Yisrael, you have to say in Hebrew. To Hebrew, you can say in Hebrew without understanding, and better to say it in Hebrew. Don't say Tehillim in English. You don't have to understand Tehillim. Even though it's considered learning Torah, and you have to understand Tehillim, you can read all day long without understanding one word. Better to read Tehillim in Hebrew. But in regards to prayer, this should be a very basic and fundamental thing that you want to concentrate on, so you want to master it. You want to learn slowly, slowly. So the important thing is learn the Shema Yisrael, learn the words. And every week, work, work on one bracha. So you know the meaning to it, that you can say it in Hebrew and pronounce it the right way. Because to, to, to make you understand what it means when you say it in Hebrew, remember in the olden days we had these radios with the dial, and if you're not right on the frequency, you hear all the static. This is, this is davening. And if you don't say it the right way, that's why the pro pronunciation is so important. You go to a shul, you hear the Baal Koreh, reads from the Torah. If he, chas v'shalom, will say he, the whole congregation, who? <laughs> oh, one little dot. Uh, this one little dot is very important. So how you pronounce the word is how it sounds in Shemaim. The Baal Shem Tov once saw some of his people, followers, wherever was in the shul, they were talking. So he told him, you know that one day you'll come up to Shemaim and they'll play the recording of your downing. So you know how it's going to sound? Hey, so how, how are you doing today? So you're going to hear the downing, you're going to hear the pasuk and the, the nonsense that you talked in between. So every word that comes out of our mouth, you're producing something. When you say now a, a certain pasuk, you are pr pr producing, you're creating spiritual letters. So you want to pronounce it the right way. There's a reason why every little dot is so particular. If it's a kamatz, if it's a patach, there's a reason for that. This is not an invention. It's not somebody came and said, okay, let me, let me torture them now, and I'm going to put a little dot. There's a reason for that, how you pronounce the word. So you want to slowly, slowly learn and know how to say the bracha. What does it mean? So you can concentrate on that. And I guarantee to you, your davening is going to be a thousand times more powerful and you're actually going to be able to bring to you this energy back to you so you want to slowly slowly better faster taking your time and yeah tefillah is one of the most important things that it's the basic the foundation of our service of God and if somebody is not concentrating on their tefillah then they're missing a big piece of their avodah of the avodah Hashem so the point is, because I know you have a lot of questions, and I want to answer all your questions. How do you know? I know. <laughs> what, what, what we want to take out of tonight is very, very simple. The concept that I can constantly correct the wrongdoing that I did, and the reason why I am doing some bad things, let's call it, is to correct it, is to refine it. To, to have the ability of taking something that is not so refined and to refine it. And to be able to do the motion 
or that I can transform darkness into light? There's a question in the Zohar, why, what, what is our Avodah in this world? Why are, we, why, why are we here? What are we supposed to do here? Rabbi Shimon says in the Zohar, we were created for one thing. I have to subdue my Sidracha, my evil inclination. Constantly, all day long, it will come and attack me, and I have to subdue it. And when I subdue it, this is called itkafia. Itkafia is to subdue. If I'm able to subdue my Yetzirah, the result will be transforming the darkness into light and bitterness into sweetness. That's why I'm here. So constantly, I'm going to have a battle with my Yetzirah. My job is not to fall into despair. Rather to, I'm like a, a fight, I'm Mike Tyson right now. And I have to fight him. And every time I knock him down, I did my job. This is what I was, what I was created for. So that's why there's even the, con the, the concept of me able to sin. Why? So I can get up. Because Hashem wants us to be Balei Tshuva. When first when we got the Torah, we were in the level of Tzadikim. But then we sinned in the golden calf. So when we got the second set of the Torah, we were already in the level of the Baal Tshuva. The Gemara says, "Bemakom she tzadikim gmorim omdim." Excuse me. Bemakom she balei tshuva omdim tzadikim gmorim and ram yecholim lamod. A place where a Baal Tshuva is standing, a tzadik gmor cannot stand. Why? Because a tzadik can reach a certain level. Of course, the tzadikim say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Don't take it the wrong way." Where a Baal Tshuva stands. So the king Burim and Amicholim Lamo, they continue going and going. But the point is that a Baal Tshuva is, is a higher level than a Tzaddik. So a Baal Tshuva, you have to understand, is not a person that's Choser B'Tshuva. There's two t different terms. Choser B'Tshuva is a person who constantly Choser to the sin. He goes back to the sin, goes back to the Tshuva, goes back to the sin, goes back to the Tshuva. This is Choser B'Tshuva. Baal Tshuva is a person who owns the Tshuva. Like you own a house, you are the Be'alim, the owner. So Baal Tshuva is that I conquered it, that's it. So Hashem wants us to be Baal Tshuva. He wants us to be in a very high level. So He gives us the option of sinning so I can get up, brush it off and move on. And the point is that this is part of my Avodah. And I have to reach into the depth of my Neshama to pull out the data, the information. What am I supposed to do? I open up my eyes today, I say, Modeani, okay, Hashem, what, what's the job, for, what's the task for today? Give me the task. That's why the first thing I do in the morning is I go and pray. So I can open up a channel and get some information. Oh, I have to do this today. You do it the right way, you're going to get it very obvious and clear. That's why it's even for women, it's good to pray shacharit. So wake up half an hour earlier. Why? Because when you target yourself and you center yourself the right way, when you're done praying, it will come into you like a, like a you'll get a fax from Shemaim. This is what you have to do today. This is my task. A woman has no her problem with time. A man has to pray till Zman Tfila. A woman is not bound to time. Of course, it's not the right way to pray Shacharit at 10 o'clock at night. You want to you wanna, <laughs> you wanna match it more or less to the time. I, I thought maybe it's like uh, till 12. No, that's for men. Oh. Men have what's called a Zman Tfila, Zman Kiachma, so Zman Tfila. I feel so bad. Yeah, this is the men's problem. A man cannot pray Shacharit at 12 in the afternoon. This is, this is not considered a right prayer. Hold on, I'm going to be with you in a second. A woman is not bound to time. But the point is, is not to make your life hard. I'm not coming to make your life hard, and the sages didn't come to make your life hard. Exactly. exactly. I don't want to go down to the, to the halacha here. You wake up in the morning, pray Shacharit. And if it's already 2 in the afternoon, then pray Mincha. You want to center it to the time that that's what's going on there. Because each tefillah, each prayer is corresponding to a certain piece of the day. But the point is, is not to go down now to, to, to the halakha, how to do every little thing. The point is to understand is that every day of my life is a very important day. And if I do not fulfill my mission that day, I wasted a day. And sometimes the Yetzer Ara is going to come and tell you, yeah, feed a thousand people today and do everything that you do to distract you from what you have to focus on. How do, how do I know? That's exactly what I say, that when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you do is you, 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 you pray, you learn, you center yourself to the Kadosh Baruch so you can get this hashra'ah. Now, if a, if a person starts the day and by opening the newspaper and reading his emails and answering his messages and, and 
First of all, most likely he will pray at 11. That's the Barishon. Dabar Shani, it says, Kol Chelev Lehavaya, the fat of the Korban, of the sacrifice, has to go to Hashem. The Bar Shem Dov says that's the morning hours, which means you wake up in the morning, you don't open the phone, you don't open the computer, you don't do anything, you go to the mikveh, you go and learn, so you can dive in with a minion right away. So you open your day with fila and meditation, and then right away you learn. Uh, then you become, a, a, if you become a, a, an open channel, then Hashem already will give you the, the, the hashra'a, what's your job for today? It will just be obvious. You know how it will be obvious? You'll walk out of the shul and somebody come and tell you, listen, I'm stuck with my car, can you help me push it? That's the mitzvah for the day. And it might, it might not come in the, in the morning, it might come in the afternoon. That your friend or somebody will come and tell you, I really need help right now. And you'll be like, no, but I'm planning on going to the shul Torah. But I really need your help right now. And you'll be like, that's, that's, the, that's the birur of the day. And you're not going to try to somehow avoid it in any way because it's going to be clear that that's what you have to do today. But you have to ask Hashem, Hashem, I'm your evid, I'm your servant. What am I doing today? What, what is the job? But you cannot do that if you're starting your day at 11 and you cannot do that if you don't center yourself, if you're not focused the right way. That's why you start the day the right way. And how do you start it? The night before. The way you set your bed, that's how you're going to sleep, that's how you're going to wake up. So if you started the night before by tshuva, tshuva is cleaning my, my plate. If I did something severe, the, the, the tshuva on Kirat Shema Lamita is not going to really help much. Although in Davar Omer Bifnei HaTshuva, if my tshuva is sincere, even if I did something severe at night, I still have, you know, there's a whole co a, a question. Unfortunately, in our generation, many men, they, they, they fail in a certain avera. And the Yetzer Ara will make them in the morning not to go and pray. Oh, last night you did such a big Avera. How are you going to go and pray tonight or tomorrow? You have the chutzpah to walk into a shul. The tzai is that even if a person, if a man falls in that sin at night, he should still say Kiyach Malamita. Because why go to sleep with all this dirt on you? Okay, you can find a mikveh if you live in a place like this. I don't know how it is in Ramat Bechemesh, where I live. You can find a mikveh 24 hours a day. So you go to the mikveh, yeah, you do, you do your shtedlut. You can't find the mikveh, go take a shower, a long shower. You can't feel, do that, there's certain things what you can do. Hold on, I'm with you in five minutes. The point... Mr. Donovan? Uh, no, we have 12 minutes. The point is, is that everything can and has to be corrected. And every moment of my day, I have the opportunity to fix what I didn't do. And this is the main message of behind the, the, the Pesach Sheni is that even if I miss something in the morning, not to fall into despair and say, okay, that's it, I'm, I messed up, then the whole day is, 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 is messed up. No, every second I can do tshuva. Every second I can correct something. And that's the state of mind that I have to live by, that I constantly have the opportunity to reverse the situation. But ultimately, ultimately, the main thing where we want to take from this whole concept of Pesach Sheni, what did they really do? The people who were impure and the people who were out on the journey, they came and demanded. It's not fair that we can't give a korban. They demanded in such a level that, a Kadosh, that the Moshe Rabbeinu went to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you know what, okay, they're demanding so much, I'll give them a second opportunity. You know why they got Pesach Shani? Because they demanded. They were like, it's not fair. It's not fair that I had some type of impurity and now I can offer the, the sacrifice. I want to offer a sacrifice, like all the Jews. They demanded the opportunity to sacrifice a korban from the Kadosh Baruch the Kadosh Baruch gave it to them. What we need to learn from that is something very, very simple. 1900 years we did not sacrifice, we didn't give offerings. 1900 years from the destruction of the second temple and nobody's demanding from Hashem that we want to give a korban. Nobody's demanding from the Kadosh Baruch I want to give a korban. How can it be that I don't have a better mikdash here? The problem is that nobody's demanding it. If one person will demand, hey, I want a Bet HaMikdash, it's not fair. It's not fair that 2,000 years ago my ancestors were able to give us a Korban. Why can't I give one? It's not acceptable. And if we demand from the Kadosh Baruch to have the Bet HaMikdash because we want to do the Korban, we're going to get it. 
The problem is that we don't demand. And this is Pesach Sheni. If you want to meditate on something for Pesach Sheni, is you demand from the Kedosh Baruch we want the Beit HaMikdash already. I want to come, I want to buy a sheep, and I want to bring it to Yerushalayim. I'm, I, 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 I'm fed up with this. And if I don't demand, I'm not going to get nothing. We don't demand. That's the problem. That's why we're still in Galos. That's what the Rebbe says. We need to demand that the Gula is going to be right now. I want the Beit HaMikdash. It's not fair. Why am I different from a Jew from 2,000 years ago? Why he could come to Beit HaMikdash with a, with a, with a sacrifice? What am I different from him? That's what the the attitude should be for everybody, not only for Lubavitch. The attitude should be that every Jew should demand. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I want Bet HaMikdash. I'm not able to fulfill 80% of my mitzvot. Because I don't have Bet HaMikdash. And I don't have priests. And I can't do Shmit. And I can't do Meister. And I can't do all of these things. That's not fair. The problem is that we're not demanding the Gula. This is Pesach Sheni. We have to start demanding. Okay? Questions?